Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another filled episode of your favorite public affairs programming. Uh, please, I put this disclaimer out all the time. We are on Facebook. We are on YouTube. YouTube.com slash North Star Oasis and Facebook.com slash North Star Oasis. So please like us on Facebook. Check out our YouTube channel. And it is June 1st today. Must be global warming. It's a little warm out. Here I am burrowed up in a sweater, and yet uh, it, it's got to be global warming. I mean, we get this three, three months out of the year, June, July, and August. And now we're in June, and the weather's starting to warm up. I hope you had a great Memorial Day weekend, and I hope you're all ready for summer. But speaking of climate change, some news came out today, something we talked about on our show last week about the Paris Climate Accord. And I had read last week a letter from 22 United States Senators to President Trump urging him to back out of the climate deal. And he announced today that the U.S. is withdrawing from the climate deal. Now, what we're going to do is actually show you our Prager University uh, segment called Climate Change. What's so alarming? And then uh, after that, we'll get a little bit into the Trump announcement today. Carbon emissions are rising, and faster than most scientists predicted. But many climate change alarmists seem to claim that all climate change is worse than expected. This ignores that much of the data is actually more encouraging than expected. Yes, Arctic sea ice is melting faster than models expected, but models also predicted that Antarctic sea ice would decrease, yet Antarctic sea ice is increasing. Yes, sea levels are rising, but the rise is not accelerating. If anything, two recent papers, one by Chinese scientists published in January 2014 and the other by U.S. scientists published in May 2013, have shown a small decline in the rate of sea level increase. We are often being told that we're seeing more and more droughts, but a study published in March 2014 in the journal Nature actually shows a decrease in the world's surface that has been afflicted by droughts since 1982. Facts like these are important because a one-sided focus on worst-case stories is a poor foundation for sound policies. Hurricanes are likewise used as an example of things getting worse. But look at the US, where we have the best statistics. If we adjust for population and wealth, hurricane damage during the period of 1900 to 2013 actually decreased slightly. At the UN Climate Conference in Lima, Peru in December 2014, Attendees were told that their countries should cut carbon emissions to avoid future damage from storms like Typhoon Hagupit, which hit the Philippines during the conference, killing at least 21 people and forcing more than a million into shelters. Yet the trend for strong typhoons around the Philippines have actually declined since 1950, according to a study published in 2012 by the Journal of Climate. Again, we're told that all things are getting worse, but the facts don't support this. This does not mean global warming is not real or a problem, but the one-sided story of alarmism makes us lose focus. If we want to help the world's poor, who are the most threatened by natural disasters, it's less about cutting carbon emissions than it is about pulling them out of poverty. The best way to see this is to look at the world's death from natural disasters over time. In the Oxford University database for death rates from floods, extreme temperatures, droughts, and storms, the average in the first part of last century was more than 130 dead every year per million people. Since then, the death rates have dropped 97% to a new low in the 2010s of less than four per million. The dramatic decline is mostly due to economic developments that help nations withstand catastrophes. If you're rich like Florida, a major hurricane might cause plenty of damage to expensive buildings, but it kills few people and causes only a temporary dent in economic output. If a similar hurricane hits a poorer country like the Philippines or Guatemala, it kills many more people and can devastate the economy. So let's be clear, climate change is not worse than we thought. That doesn't mean it's not a reality or not a problem. It is. But the narrative that the world's climate is changing from bad to worse is unhelpful alarmism that prevent us from focusing on smart solutions. A well-meaning environmentalist might argue that because climate change is a reality, why not ramp up the rhetoric and focus on the bad news to make sure the public understands its importance? 
But that's exactly what we've done for the past 20 years. Yet despite dramatic headlines, apocalyptic documentaries, and annual climate summits, carbon emissions continue to rise, especially in rapidly developing countries like India, China, and many African nations. Alarmism has encouraged the pursuit of a one-sided climate policy of trying to cut carbon emissions by subsidizing wind farms and solar panels. Yet today, according to the International Energy Agency, only about 0.4% of global energy consumption comes from solar photovoltaics and windmills. And even with exceptionally optimistic assumptions about future deployment of wind and solar, the International Energy Agency expects that these energy forms will provide a minuscule 2.2% of the world's energy by 2040. In other words, for at least the next two decades, solar and wind energy are simply expensive, feel-good measures that will have an imperceptible climate impact. Instead, we should focus on investing in research and development of green energy to lower its costs. So everyone will want it, including China and India. We urgently need a more balanced climate conversation if we ought to make sensible choices and pick the right climate policy that can actually help fix climate change. I'm Bjorn Lomborg, president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. So that's why I recommended last week that staying in the, the Paris Climate Accord is a bad deal. And Donald Trump agrees with me. Or I agree with Donald Trump, it just depends on which way you want to look at it. Anyhow, here is Donald Trump from this afternoon on the U.S. will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. I am fighting every day for the great people of this country. Therefore, in order to fulfill my solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord, but begin negotiations to re-enter either the Paris Accord or in really entirely new transaction on terms that are fair to the United States, its businesses, its workers, its people, its taxpayers. So we're getting out, but we will start to negotiate, and we will see if we can make a deal that's fair. And if we can, that's great. And if we can't, that's fine. See, the primary backers of the accord were big business, big American businesses. All they wanted to do was be able to make an, an, an unfair advantage for themselves because they would be able to handle the cost of regulations. Companies like Facebook and Unilever, I'm um, just trying to remember off the top of my head some of the uh, Apple, you know, these big corporate conglomerates that have the wherewithal to be able to handle the regulations that come with this puts them at an advantage because smaller manufacturers get hurt. They don't have the finances to be able to do this. And this doesn't say anything about China or India, any of the other countries that can go ahead and just ignore the agreement because really there is no teeth to this. There isn't. It's a climate accord. It's not a treaty. There is no enforcement provision. It's a voluntary disclosure which means that the United States could and tried under President Barack Obama to enforce this, whereas a company like, or a country like China will ignore it. Hey, we want business. We want American businesses to come over here. So we're not going to deal with the whole uh, Paris Climate Accord. We're going to just ignore that, and most of those don't impact us till 2030 anyway. In the meantime, businesses go from the United States over to China, and... Uh, the factories in America close the doors. That's what a lot of this is about. So let's take a look at the uh, announcement on the ceasing of using the Paris Pact standards. This is President Trump from this afternoon. As president, I can put no other consideration before the well-being of American citizens. The Paris Climate Accord is simply the latest example of Washington entering into an agreement that disadvantages the United States. 
to the exclusive benefit of other countries, leaving American workers, who I love, and taxpayers to absorb the cost in terms of lost jobs, lower wages, shuttered factories, and vastly diminished economic production. Thus, as of today, the United States will cease all implementation of the non-binding Paris Accord and the draconian financial and economic burdens the agreement imposes on our country. Not only does this deal subject our citizens to harsh economic restrictions, it fails to live up to our environmental ideals. As someone who cares deeply about the environment, which I do, I cannot in good conscience support a deal that punishes the United States, which is what it does. The world's leader in environmental protection, while imposing no meaningful obligations on the world's leading polluters. In short, the agreement doesn't eliminate coal jobs. It just transfers those jobs out of America and the United States and ships them to foreign countries. I'm willing to immediately work with democratic leaders to either negotiate our way back into Paris under the terms that are fair to the United States and its workers, or to negotiate a new deal that protects our country and its taxpayers. So if the obstructionists want to get together with me, let's make them non-obstructionists. I will work to ensure that America remains the world's leader on environmental issues, but under a framework that is fair and where the burdens and responsibilities are equally shared. Now, as I just said, the Paris Agreement it was basically an attempt to halt climate change on an honor system. It's only re legal requirements for, for signatories like the United States or Germany to announce goals and give progress reports. Uh, there's no in international enforcement mechanism. Uh, as a result, it was likely that the United States, Britain, France, uh, other industrial countries, uh, wealthy European nations would have adopted and implemented severe climate change rules, but a lot of the third world developing nations would just avoid doing anything that would slow, slow down their own economies. As I pointed out uh, just a moment ago, China and India, two of the largest BRIC nations uh, in particular. So essentially it made us sacrificial lambs to the cause of climate change. That's all it did. Um, the regulations necessary to implement the Paris Agreement would have cost the U.S. industrial sector 1.1 million jobs. Now, I know President Trump campaigned that he's going to bring jobs back to the United States. And staying in this, according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, 1.1 million jobs would have been lost in America because of this. And the job losses would center in cement, iron, and steel, along with petroleum refinery. Uh, so industrial output would definitely decline sharply. Now, uh, about a year and a half ago, we highlighted SR Steel Minnesota and their tax grab. Um, that we, Minnesota, Upper Michigan, big iron producing states, not as big as they used to be, but you know, that, those are the jobs that are at stake. Minnesota's 8th Congressional District livelihood is at stake because of the Paris Climate Agreement. Let's do one more on uh, the financial cost of the Paris Accord. Uh, no responsible leader. can put the workers and the people of their country at this debilitating and tremendous disadvantage. The fact that the Paris deal hamstrings the United States while empowering some of the world's top polluting countries should dispel any doubt as to the real reason why foreign lobbyists wish to keep our magnificent country tied up and bound down by this agreement. It's to give their country 
an economic edge over the United States. That's not going to happen while I'm president. I'm sorry. At what point does America get demeaned? At what point do they start laughing at us as a country? We want fair treatment for its citizens, and we want fair treatment for our taxpayers. We don't want other leaders and other countries laughing at us anymore, and they won't be. They won't be. I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. <laughs> Foreign leaders in Europe, Asia, and across the world should not have more to say with respect to the U.S. economy than our own citizens and their elected representatives. Thus, our withdrawal from the agreement represents a reassertion of America's sovereignty. And time to pursue a new deal that protects the environment, our companies, our citizens, and our country. It is time to put Youngstown, Ohio, Detroit, Michigan, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, along with many, many other locations within our great country, before Paris, France. It is time to make America great again. Thank you. I have the list of uh, big businesses that supported the Paris Climate Deal. Paris Climate Deal. Uh, Apple, General Electric, Intel, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Morgan Stanley, General Mills, uh, a Minnesota company, General Mills, of all, uh, of all people or businesses. Uh, Walmart, DuPont, Unilever, and Johnson & Johnson. And the thing is, like I said, these business giants, they can afford this a whole lot more than a startup or a small business or even a medium-sized business can. But here's another important thing here, and that is how bad the industrial carnage would hit four states. Michigan, Missouri, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Uh, according to the Chamber of Commerce study, Michigan's GDP would shrink by 0.8% and employment would contract by 74,000 jobs. Missouri, Missouri's GDP, that would shrink by 1%. Ohio's GP, GDP, 1.2%. Pennsylvania's GDP, 1.8%. These are declines. Pennsylvania would lose 140,000 jobs. And then a Heritage Foundation study, they found that the Paris Agreement would have increased electricity cost for an American family of four between 13 and 20 percent annually. Loss of income by about $20,000 by 2035. In other words, you're paying. You will be paying more under the guise of climate change. And as we discussed last week, that the Paris Climate Agreement will not change the climate. From now until 2035, you will be paying more, but somebody in China and India will not be paying anything. You're subsidizing them. That's what this does. So I do think that, oh, and I guess I get one more point. Uh, the overall effect of the agreement would have reduced the U.S. GDP by two and a half trillion, and it would have eliminated 400,000 jobs by 2035, and also, that's also according to Heritage uh, Foundation study. And that would just exacerbate more problems with government funding and deficits. And then Social Security, which is already having a problem with solvency, would even be more challenging. And we'd be increasing more reliance on the national debt. And that, of course, will increase inflation and, de and it'll devalue our dollar even further. That's how bad this thing is. And that's why last week I mentioned that President Trump really needs to pull us out of this. Now, the one thing I have to say about President Trump, and this is why he was elected as president, that despite whatever you hear for rhetoric, despite whether or not you like his tone of voice, Donald Trump is an American, and we've highlighted on the show during the campaign different things that he did on his own to better New York when he was a New Yorker. You know, that's the one thing you can always say about Donald Trump is he does believe in America first, and he is the President of the United States of America. 
And there are going to be plenty of union Democrats who are going to be benefiting from Trumpian policies on the economy once those iron mines increase, once we get the infrastructure packages passed. Plenty of Democrats are going to be represented by President Trump as much as Republicans. Donald Trump is an American president looking out for the betterment of American citizens. And regardless of what you think of his tone of voice or any other rhetoric, that's the one thing that I don't think anybody can disagree with. Because in the few short months that he's been president, he's already proven that. Anyhow, we're going to move on. We have been dealing with a long series. We're going to get that series back on track as best we can for what time we've got left today. We are looking at the history of the Middle East and U.S. involvement. So we started part one back on April 7th. That was Kurdish independence, American hostage crisis in Iran, the Iran-Iraq war, uh, chemical attack at Halabja, Iraq invades Kuwait. And then part two a week later on April 14th, uh, we continue the Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Desert Fox, Desert Thunder, the Iraq Liberation Act, and the September 11th attack and Operation Enduring Freedom. Part three, uh, following week, uh, April 21st, the September 11th attack, uh, Obama, uh, Osama bin Laden's list of demands, sorry about that, uh, fighting in Tora Bora cave complex, rare earth elements discovered in Afghanistan. We continue with part four with the creation of Afghanistan and then the great game, the uh, Afghan-Pakistan border known as the Duran Line, then the formation of the Afghanistan Emirate and Kingdom, and finished with the Saar Revolution in 1978. Of course, we weren't done there because we had to continue on May 5th with Part 5 for the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Operation Cyclone, and the Mujahideen. And uh, Part 6, we finished with the Peshawa Accord, and this was uh, May 18th. And then the Afghan st Civil War, Rise of the Taliban, Osama bin Laden, and Al-Qaeda Formation. So essentially, where we are at in that part of the process brings us up to the 2001 to 2003 era. Uh, so we've got Iraq covered up to there. We've got Afghanistan covered up to there. We uh, did cover Kuwait. But there's still a lot more. And we're not even talking Israel and Palestine yet. Um, but if we were to redo this, if I were to start this whole thing from scratch, where would I begin? Because honestly, when we, start, when we started this, um, I didn't expect it to be a series. I really did not. Uh, I thought we were going to just take one or two episodes, just do a, a, a 30,000 foot level overview, and we're not going to get bogged down in the weeds, and that was it. Well, uh, here we are on part seven. So I figured in order for us to really get into this, we're going to go back in time quite a bit. Now, this, uh, this is the 30,000-foot overview. We are going to take a look at the pre-Islamic history of the Middle East, uh, before the 7th century, before the Prophet Muhammad. Um, we, uh, you're, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you're going to hear some of the uh, places that are written about in the Old Testament are in, in our clips. We are not going to get into a theological discussion, so I'm not going to be using the Old Testament completely as the baseline, and we're not going to be looking at the Quran as a baseline either. We are not looking at this from a religious perspective. We're looking at it from history, from historical perspective, anthropological perspective, cultural perspective, and we're just trying to get the basis in how we got here. So let's take a look at the pre-Islamic history of the Middle East. In the 14th century, a Muslim historian named Ibn Khaldun wrote about the ancient empires and how the first civilizations emerged along major rivers, the Hang Ho Valley in China, Indus River in Pakistan and more famously the Nile River in Egypt. The historian wrote how these rivers allowed easy access to trade and commerce and from there grew into major cities and then to civilizations. But more interestingly, Ibn Khaldun wrote about the pattern of history. Farmers would build irrigation systems supporting villages and towns. Later on, some warrior would bring these towns under his rule and form a united political entity, like a kingdom or an empire. 
then a tribe of nomads would come along and conquer this kingdom and seize all the holdings and settle in their place and further expand the new empire. As time went by, the nomads would assimilate and become soft city dwellers, exactly the kind of people they had conquered before. And at this point, another tribe of nomads would come along and conquer them and take their empire. Conquest, consolidation, expansion, degeneration and conquest. This was the pattern Ibn Khaldun wrote about. The first civilization was the land between the rivers of Tigris and Euphrates, later known as Mesopotamia and Babylon. Less known are the Sumerians, who started it all. They united the cities near the river of Euphrates into a single network called Sumer. They invented writing, the wheel, the cart, etc. Later, the Akkadians, a mountainous people to the north, conquered Sumer and their leader Sargon Akkad became the first conqueror known by name. At the time, this was the largest kingdom, and Sargon famously said, Now any king who wants to call himself my equal, wherever I went, let him go. He basically said, let's see anyone conquer as much as I have. His kingdom was smaller than Serbia. Later, the Akkadians were conquered by another nomadic tribe and the newcomers were then conquered by others and so it went on. The Gutians, Hurrians, Amorites, they all conquered, settled, expanded a little and then assimilated from warrior to city folk. But every conquest left something behind. The Amorites founded the city of Babylon and from this city emerged the first Babylonian empire. The Babylonians were pioneers in astronomy and mathematics. Then the Assyrian tribe to the north took it over and founded the Assyrian Empire. Their capital, Nineveh, is considered one of the greatest cities in antiquity. The Assyrians made a number of innovations and improvements. They erected the first library and used paved roads. They even came up with the first kind of imperial administration in which subject nations and vessels reported to a central authority. But the Assyrian rulers also gained a reputation as merciless tyrants. Now, it's hard to say if they were really worse than the other rulers in their time, but one of their strategies to keep the realm stable was by moving whole populations to other places. After a while, the Assyrians lost their power to other tribes like the Sumerian descendants, Babylonians, Kashites. These tribes fought each other for about two centuries until the Assyrians came back and re-established their empire and returned to their divide and rule strategy. Eventually, the Assyrians fell to one of their subject nations, the Chaldeans. They rebuilt the second Babylonian empire and they're well known for their achievements in astronomy, medicine, architecture and mathematics. In fact, it was the Chaldeans who built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the ancient seven world wonders. But the Chaldeans followed the same strategy as the Assyrians had by uprooting whole populations in order to divide and rule. It was the Chaldean king of Babylonia, Nebuchadnezzar, who first smashed Jerusalem and dragged the Hebrews into captivity. Then came the invasion by the highland people to the east, the Persians and the Medes. The Babylonians were defeated and their infrastructure and political system was used to found the Persian Empire. The Persian Emperor Cyrus the Great had conquered the known world. His realm extended from the Nile to the Indus River. But the Persians are best known for their political reforms. They followed the opposite strategy of the Assyrians. They set the Hebrews free from captivity and resettled populations to their native lands. The Persians pursued a policy of multiculturalism. People were allowed to live however they saw fit and worship whatever gods they wanted as long as they paid their taxes to the central authority. They issued a common currency and built a vast network of roads throughout the empire. 
The Persian libraries were so large that there is in fact more information about this period 3000 years ago than there is in Europe 1200 years ago. The Persian Empire also had its own unique religion. Zoroastrianism was founded in the region of Azerbaijan, meaning the land of fire. Zoroastrianism is often misunderstood for fire worshipping, but the fire is a mere symbol for purity. The Zoroastrians basically believed in good and evil, and there was a hell and there was a hell. It was one of the earliest monotheistic religions. In the later era of the Persian Empire, they came in contact with the Greeks. The Greeks supported revolts in the Persian Empire, and this provoked the Persian Emperor Darius to punish the Greeks. Darius formed one of the largest armies ever, but the size was more a liability than an advantage. There was no real effective way to direct so many men at such a distance. In the end, it was the Greeks who taught the Persians a lesson, but the lesson was quickly forgotten. Darius' his son, Xerxes, decided to avenge his father by going after the Greeks again. This is the war that involved the famous 300 Spartans. Darius repeated his father's mistake and lost the war. 150 years later, Alexander of Macedonia took the battle the other way. He crippled the Persian army and quickly conquered all of Persia and thereby effectively conquered the known world. Alexander left a controversial mark. Cities that had surrendered to him were left unharmed, but cities that resisted were pillaged. When he had conquered the Persian capital and the palace, he burned it to the ground. Now this was one of the most prestigious buildings in the world. But on the other hand, he built the lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the ancient seven world wonders. Alexander was planning to name Babylon his new capital. And he also planned to fuse the Greek and Persian cultures into one. He recommended his generals to take Persian wives, but he died before he could implement this policy. And upon his death, his generals asked him, who should succeed you? Alexander replied, the strongest. His empire broke in pieces among the Greek generals controlling it. Then the Greeks fought each other. Eventually, the kingdoms weakened and the Greek influence diminished. Persian identity resurfaced and another empire was formed, Parthia. They didn't exactly occupy the same size as the earlier Persian Empire, but the Parthians used the existing political structure and established an empire. They later on assimilated into the Persian language and over time they became Persians. The Parthians made no significant contribution to art and culture. Simply because they didn't care for it, the Parthians were after all a nomadic warrior people but what they lacked in culture, they made up in warfare. They were the first to use cataphrats, a knight in full metal armor riding an armored horse. This would later on influence the Roman Empire's horsemen and form their European feudal knights. But the Parthians also used light cavalry who would pretend to flee in the middle of a battle. This tricked the other army to break rank and chase after them. Then the Parthian horsemen would suddenly turn wheel around and fire into their disorganized opponents. This would later be called the Parthian shot. They used these tactics and battled the Roman Empire to a standstill. When Christianity started to spread, the Parthians didn't care because they favored Zoroastrianism. In the 3rd century, a provincial rebel overthrew the last of the Parthians and founded the Sassanid dynasty and they too quickly expanded and occupied the same territory as the Parthians had. The Sassanids reformed the empire and erased the last traces of Greek influence. They built enormous monuments, buildings and cities. Zoroastrianism became the official religion. In the same era, the Roman Empire was falling apart. The Roman Emperor split the empire in two for administrative purposes but all the wealth was in the east and when the Germanic tribes moved into the western parts of the empire, the government shrank, law and order broke down, 
trade decayed and eventually the western part of the Roman Empire collapsed and Europe entered the Dark Ages. But the eastern part of the Roman Empire still lived on, however the identity between Roman and Greek was so vague that historians gave it a new name, the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantinians kept the Roman culture but didn't approve on it. For example, most people can name Roman and Greek poets and philosophists like Plato, Aristotle, Julius Caesar, Augustus, etc. But few people can name two Byzantinian poets. This empire lasted more than a thousand years, but few people can name five events that took place in the empire. Still, Byzantine was a superpower back then, the other being the Persian Empire. They fought each other in multiple wars, which generally ended in a stalemate. But both these empires neglected the developments to their southern neighbors, the Arabian Peninsula, which was about to awaken. This was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. So, uh, that's where we're at. I mean, that's how it all began. That's how the Middle East was formed. It was conquest. It was conquering. It was divide. You know, divide and conquer, divide and conquer, divide and conquer. That was the history. This group will divide and conquer that, then they'll get to a certain threshold, and then somebody else will divide and conquer again. And we saw that we see that time and time again throughout history. But now the narrator from the Caspian Report, I thought it was a fabulous video, uh, explained things very well. But the narrator mentioned that Arabia was going to awaken. And that's what happened. So we're going to actually now put our focus and effort onto pre-Islamic Arabia. What happened on the Arabian Peninsula? Arabia. One has to know the pagan religion in general. Paganism began in the land of Sumer. In Sumer, the water nymph goddess Semiramis infiltrated the camp of Noah's great-grandson King Nimrod. She was with him at the siege of Bactria and through her clever strategies she got him the victory. Then she became his queen and eventually killed him and took over his throne. She also had a son named Tammuz. In the pagan world starting from the British Isles all the way to the Far East Everyone worshipped her and her son by many different names and forms. If we can find out what these two characters were known as in Arabia, we can tell the rest of the story. Now, some of you might have heard of the three daughters of Allah they used to worship at Kaaba in Mecca. Manat, al and Alet are their names. For a starter, they are not the daughters of any god, and in reality, they were two persons depicted as three. Furthermore, there is a direct connection between these two and Hubal, who was the main deity of Kaaba. Back in the land of Sumer, the private life of Semiramis behind the closed doors of her palace was bizarre. Being a water nymph, she couldn't relate to humans at all. She was madly in love with the king of Armenia, known as Ara the Handsome. But he ignored her advances. So she went with her army to Armenia to capture him. And in the process, he was killed accidentally. Then she revealed her true self to a gardener who was very loyal to her. However, he panicked when he saw her real form, so that didn't work out as well. Meanwhile, her half-human son, Tammuz, grew up and she ended up having an incestuous relationship with him. At the same time, Tammuz fell in love with another beautiful girl named Psyche. For this, Semiramis gave her a very hard time. In the ancient world, this was a well-known incident, and it was known as the hard labors of Psyche. Psyche was known as Devasena 
are Devayani in India. However, in the Arabian Peninsula, they called her Alet. Hubal, the Arabian Tammuz, was obviously her lover. That leaves us with the other two so-called daughters of Allah, namely Manat and Alwuza. Semiramis was Manat in Arabia, since she was the consort of both Nimrod and her son Tammuz, who is Hubal. They depict her as the wife of Nimrod in the form of Manat and as the companion of Tammuz in the form of Alwuza. In India, where the color code, the date is based on their origin, it is much more evident. This is the picture of Murgan, the Indian Tammuz, flanked by two women. One of them is green in color because of her aquatic origin. They call her Valli. The other one resembles a human who is the Indian psyche known as Devayani. The green one is the Aluza of the Arabians, which is none other than Semiramis, the water nymph. Her color gives it away. Now, where is Manat, the Indian Semiramis, who married Nimrod? Well, here she is. This is Meenachi, meaning the fish lady. Again, green in color. She is also known as Parvati. Her consort Nimrod is known as Shiva in India. So, what they called the daughters of Allah and their main deity Hubal is none other than Nimrod, Tammuz and their consorts just as in the rest of the pagan world. Then, where is Allah in the midst of it all? I will explain that to you in a different clip. Now, thanks for watching. We're not going to get into where is Allah in it all. Now, I know you're probably utterly confused right now. I'm not going to give you the explanation, but that's just to show. I, I guess it, it's going to go back to when I was in graduate school at St. Cloud State University in history program. In that program, we had a course called Teaching American History. Now, we thought that we would go into class and it would be this are, these are some of the instructional techniques on how to teach American history. Wrong. What the course was about was how others view us. We looked at textbooks from around the world discussing American historical events. We looked at what the Vietnamese thought about the American Vietnam War. We looked at Russia and what they thought about the Cold War. We looked at Cuba and how they discussed the Cuban Missile Crisis and the sinking of the USS Maine. These were the things. How do other cultures view you? And so what we're trying to do is kind of, as much as I think the, the course is misnamed, I, I will have to say it at least allowed me to step outside of my Americanism sphere and actually start looking at the way other cultures start looking at each other. And that's one of the things I wanted to do here. Uh, even though it doesn't really discuss too much about the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and we're actually going to get into that in just a moment. We're going to give you a little bit better background on that. But I wanted to show you how a lot of the pre-Christian, pre-Islamic cultures are tied together uh, through religion. I mean, you take a look at the comparison between you know, this person in Arabia and this person in India, and these are the equatable people. That's the way it was. And you go back to that first video we had played, and they were talking about Zoroastrianism. You know, this is all part of culture. And so that's what I wanted to show here. Uh, I don't there is no test, so I don't expect you to know who is who, because I haven't figured out who is who. Uh, but with that, what we're going to do is we're going to show you a map video. It's on the history of the Arabian Peninsula as we get ready to look at U.S. relations, U.S. Saudi relations, you know, I'm trying to give you the background on uh, the formation of Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula. We're not going to do a major discourse on Islam. We're not going to do that. Uh, we're not going to give a major discourse on Christianity either, although we will touch briefly on Islam as it relates to Saudi Arabia from a historical context. Uh, that's about as far as we're going to go with this, at least at this time. We might cover it more in depth a little bit later. Uh, when I say a little bit later, meaning weeks down the road. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to show you the different, the different uh, 
people groups, anthropologically speaking, on how Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula got to where it is today. And we're going to go way back in history, like prehistory. So let's take a look. Since there is no narration for this, I'm not going to read the screen, but I am going to point out a few different historical things. And we're in 847. What was going on in Europe at that time, 868? Uh, this is when the Vikings were uh, conquering the British Isles. Uh, I can't remember the year, but I think it was like 761 was when the city of Dublin was founded by the Vikings. So this is the Viking Age going on in Europe. Uh, 800 was when Emperor Charlemagne had established, uh, was in charge of the Holy Roman Empire. So what you had was a series of Germanic tribes and then now we're in 1022 and the Viking Age is ending, 1047 and then 1063, three years later you had 1066 and that was the uh, invasion of the British Empire by the Normans under uh, William the Conqueror, known as William the First King of England. That was going on at this point in time. That's what Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula looked like. A lot of tribes with a lot of different dynasties that were founded. Now in 1136, the Viking Age effectively had ended. And I do know that the Vikings did have some form of influence in that region uh, during the height of their conquests. I don't believe they made it down to the Arabian Peninsula. They came up through the Rus, uh, well, essentially Russia, through the Rus River, and into the Black Sea area, but I do know they had some impact on the Middle East. Now in 1492, that's when Columbus sailed the ocean blue and settled on the island of Hispaniola. That was the beginning of the colonization of the Americas as we know it, mainly South America and Central America at that time. 1517, we were dealing with the Reformation in uh, Europe. And notice that Portugal is has a presence there. And we got the Ottomans, 1548. So you're, gonna, you're starting to see some European colonization uh, impact this particular region. And 1602, Portugal is pushed out of Bahrain. And then 1650, we've already uh, been 30 years into the Pilgrim era in America. And we've uh, been almost 50 years into uh, the Jamestown colony, 1708. So the colony of America is still growing, but we're still dependent upon Britain. 1735, George Washington was three years old. And still, the Arabian Peninsula looks pretty primitive. We're still not at the American Revolution yet. But as we get into the 17, well, 1747, that was uh, Afghanistan uh, with uh, the Durrani dynasty, which began a little bit of modernization in Afghanistan as we covered a few weeks ago. 1775, the Revolutionary War begins. Look what's happening. 1783, that was when uh, the Re American Revolution ended. And there's still nothing but revolution going on in the Arabian Peninsula. 
1800 was a feisty U.S. election with uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And that's the creation of the 12th Amendment. And here we have the War of 1812 began around this time. And now it had already ended. My fourth great-grandfather, Simon Williams, was born in 1820. So we're getting closer into our modern generation. And still we have a lot of tribal activity. We've got the British involved in uh, the Arabian Peninsula. 1835, that was when the national debt in America actually was paid off. 1868, we had already passed the United States Civil War. We're getting into the modern era. 1871. So now we're in the post-Civil War era. Reconstruction is coming to a close. 1876, George Armstrong Custer dies at Little Bighorn. And here we are in the 20th century. starting to see a little bit more uh, activity in the Arabian Peninsula as we get in the eve of World War I. And here we are in World War I. Qatar becomes a protectorate of the UK. Yemen becomes independent again. Here we are in the end of World War I. In the interwar years and we have a large conquest. Neutral zones are now established between Iraq, Kuwait, and uh, Nej. Nineteen fifty-two, Eisenhower administration. Nineteen sixty-one, John F. Kennedy administration. Buffer zones in Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. Neutral zone ends in 1965, 1967, America was in Vietnam, 1971, I was born. And now we're starting to see what Saudi Arabia, looking, and you see Saudi Arabia there now, 1983, that was not that long ago, 1990, the uh, Iraq invasion of Kuwait, and then the Gulf War ended, Operation Desert Storm, which we've covered on this program. So that's what the formation looked like, empire after empire, conquest, division, conquest, division, conquest, division, and then modernity. I bring all of this up to give us a reference point for the future and future episodes. Um, I guess before... Before we end, we got one more video, and this is um, a trailer from a film. It's called Muhammad, Legacy of a Prophet. It's only 30 seconds. Let's take a look at this, and then we'll flip to the next thing. 1,400 years ago, a humble merchant who could not read or write changed the face of Arabia. His name was Muhammad. Today, his influence has spread to every corner of the world, including the United States. This is his story, and the story of millions of Americans who revere him as God's final prophet. We really discuss uh, Islam, but with the Arabian Peninsula and with uh, Medina and Mecca being on the Arabian Peninsula and part of Saudi Arabia, that is a very, very, very big part of that history, so I wanted to at least make a, a passing reference to it. Now... We're going to pick up more, more uh, when we get this discussion going again. We're going to pick it up a lot closer to our modern era and less about the ancient times. But I wanted to take one episode to bring it up to date. But then this last Saturday, I'm going to turn the page here. It was Memorial Day on Monday. And then last Saturday, there was a funeral for Glendon I.C. Iverson. 
in um, Emmons, Minnesota, down by the Minnesota-Iowa line. Here's some fun uh, photos from his funeral. And he is, he, he perished on December 7th, 1941 on the USS Oklahoma at Pearl Harbor. And that's a story that we've been following in depth uh, since, uh, really since we began the show. Uh, and the fact that the U.S. government is repatriating the um, remains, or the, they're using the DNA analysis to um, identify the unknown remains of those from the USS Oklahoma. And every so often we hear about another one coming home. And Fireman Third Class, uh, Glendon Iverson, uh, I'm really glad to know that he's finally at rest in his final resting spot and his family and those in the Emmons community are now at peace knowing that Fireman Third Class Iverson is home. So uh, welcome home, uh, Sailor. Thank you for your service. We really do appreciate it. And with that, we are going to, uh, well, we're going to get ready here in, uh, in a little bit for our, our final music. I guess I just want to say, uh, with doing this show, one of the things that we do pride ourselves on is um, our tribute to American veterans. And so when we have an opportunity like this for uh, giving a tribute to a fallen service member, even if it's 75 and a half years since his uh, death, you know, we're here to honor him. So with that, we're going to have the sea, cha uh, sea Chanters from the U.S. Navy Band doing the Navy hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. <laughs> The freedoms we cherish do not come without a price. The United States sailor has defended this nation from its birth to the present day, and will continue to do so throughout the millennium. With a devotion to duty and a willingness to sacrifice, the United States sailor exemplifies the Navy's core values of honor, courage, and commitment. We honor that valor, and we salute their sacrifice. For Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis, reminding you there's 206 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. <laughs>